So that's the rundown, right? That's the rundown. And now, da 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 da, <laughs> it's time for our special guest, Colton Omeg. Yay! So, Colton, the name of your class is Hermeticism: A Pagan Path. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So how about you tell everyone a little bit about who you are and what kind of brought you to put this class together? Okay. Um, well, I've been practicing paganism since I was 13, and I came in more into interest in hermeticism around 18 or so when I started having dreams and things that involved uh, Hermes Trismegistus, the main deity slash prophet of hermeticism. And so, kind of gradually over the years, I delved more and more into that until that became my predominant practice. Um, I also work with uh, an older brother who is a psychic medium. We have another business um, called uh, Wisconsin Oracle, where we give um, mediumship readings, um, as well as do things like house cleansings or spiritual healings or spiritual counseling. So we've done a lot of like haunted house kind of things, not in the Halloween sense, but mm -hmm. in the like actual sure. like my house is haunted. Uh -huh. and how do I get rid of it? Kind of I can't believe I bought this place. And right. Now yeah. I find out that I don't get to sleep up through the night every day. <laughs> right. Yeah. And we come at it from a pagan perspective, which is we found to be very unique, very different than like what a lot of other people are doing. We meet a lot of the light workers, and I certainly trained as a light worker for a number of years. Yeah, I mean, they're great, but they, uh, a lot of them do admit they don't know how to handle darker entities because it's not really part of their world view. Yeah. So that's where we kind of step in and we take care of it. I mean, we work for, with a variety of pagan gods of both light and dark energies and nature energies and whatever is needed for that situation. So as far as uh, teaching pagan, or teaching hermeticism specifically from a pagan point of view, um, if you read a lot of books on hermeticism, even though it comes from ancient Egypt and ancient Greeks, and you'll see a number of different gods mentioned in the texts, a lot of it was transmitted today through Christian sources who focused on the fact that the texts tend to emphasize a father god or a one high god kind of view, so they downplay all the rest of the elements quite heavily. So I approach it from what I view as the more original pagan perspective of Yes, the text talk of the gods as if they were human prophets or such, but that's just part of ancient Egyptian belief where they believe that the gods had once lived on Earth at an earlier time, and gradually they kind of reascended, but they still communicate psychically. Like, I personally, because of my psychic experiences and those of my brother, I believe that a lot of the texts in the Hermetica uh, were channeled information, not just as what you'll see in a lot of scholars will just say, oh, well, it was just whoever random person was just putting it down what they thought and then wrote Hermes's name on it. Well, in our experience, we view it as, no, that was somebody who was uh, psychically speaking to Hermes, and he told, and he said, this is what it is, and the person put it down, and kind of thing is our view. Mm -hmm. So, as far as teaching Hermeticism class, um, I've done a similar class before. And I'd like to expand on that now, especially with like deeper into kind of the history and background of it, especially um, how is Hermeticism practiced? How can you practice it as a pagan and not from the more Judeo-Christian standpoint like it was taught in the 1900s? That was like the big thing back then was they call it Hermeticism, but then you'd really be learning Kabbalah and stuff about like the Hebrew mysticism, where this is uh, what is the authentic Egyptian and Greek elements of it? And it's, I've been writing a book on it now for a number of months. Yeah. Um, so soon you'll be at one of our author events. Uh, yeah. I'm very hopefully Excellent. so. Yeah, I'm Excellent. hoping it'll be done uh, by the latest middle of this year. So. Nice. So, That's great. Yeah, so in all my research, I'm just amazed how much is authentically from ancient Egypt. If you read all this stuff, we're like, oh, it's not really Egyptian. It's really uh, Hebrew or Christian or Greek. But... I'm just amazed flipping through things that from Egypt from that same time period those texts came from. It's like, oh no, this is all like the same group of people who are writing these spell books here and are in these temples here. They're definitely associated with these people writing these hermetic books. I mean, you're seeing just this overlap of terminology and gods and things like that, and stuff that only makes like sense once you go back to the Egyptian sources from the Roman period of Roman Egypt. I mean, it's really fascinating. 
So I really want to share that with everyone. Like, yes. how can you yes. practice that? And uh, in my opinion, you don't have to have like an exclusive interest in like ancient Egyptian or ancient Greek deities. I feel like the m predominant point in Hermeticism is more the philosophy element. And after that, you can kind of work with whatever tradition you really want. Um, I mean, in my practice, I don't really work with runes for one, for some reason, it's just the one divination tool I don't resonate as well with. I, I'm much more of a tarot and oracle card person, but I've tried runes, and uh, I've had, um, when working with my brother with runes, we've had Hermes psychically come in and say, and explain the runes, and the, you know, so like, it doesn't matter what tradition they're from, they might know all of what we are doing, you know. Sure. It's not like, I mean, these are cosmic deities, they're like above, like, they're not gods like, oh, I only work with people from this country, kind of thing. So, I mean, yeah, they're very aware of different, like, transcultural things. Uh, so, yeah, so I really love, love to share that element um, of what I do and kind of show other people how to follow that kind of practice. If you're interested in, especially that period where Greek, Egyptian, Roman, and Middle Eastern were all, like, really intermixed and it was all really philosophical, if you have an interest in like that kind of high magic tradition, but all you really find are like these 17, 1800s grimoires that come from a very Judeo-Christian basis where it's like uh, imprison this angel in this circle and force him by the you know names of God to do this for you. Uh, where this is more like, no, we'll call on you know the Egyptian deities, or, you know, an angels if you want to, but you work with them and you appreciate them and everything is like, is a give and take back and forth in, in friendship and relationship. It's not a demand or a command. So, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to teaching this class coming up in April. Nice, nice. And I, I like that you said that, talking about it's building the relationship with the spirits. It's not necessarily about commanding or demanding. Because I know for myself, like, I've been like, what is hermeticism exactly? Right. You know, and my understanding. Well, it's of very this, hard to find good information yeah. because. It was used as an umbrella term for pretty much all Western magic esoteric tradition for like two for several hundred years. So you look it up and you get into Kabbalah, you get into grimoires, you get into even early Wicca, and it all seems like how is any of this stuff relating? So I go back to what would properly be called Hermetism rather than Hermeticism, okay. you know, where it's focused on just the Hermes Egyptian philosophy part of it. Okay, so so really, to, to try and understand, Hermeticism is kind of a philosophy. Yeah, it's like and, a spiritual philosophy. And you're philosophy. taking that philosophy and applying it through a pagan lens. Right. So what do you mean by pagan in this context? Well, I guess in this case, I mostly mean polytheistic. Okay. But in a sense of working with a broader kind of genre of deities, so okay. especially Egyptian and where a lot of Hermeticists in the last several hundred years, they might call on certain Egyptian deities or whatnot, but overall they kind of had a largely Judeo-Christian worldview. Um, like again, Golden Dawn or Alfred Crowley, it's kind of a mixed thing there. Like the main focus is always kind of that there's this higher power, this main Judeo-Christian style god and the other Egyptian deities that kind of get involved kind of become more like aspects you take on or something symbolic where I want to take it beyond that to work with those deities as actual entities, yeah, deities. not just as um, aspects or egregores, right, yeah. egregores aspects of archetypes of the unconscious. That's all mm -hmm. fine, but from my experience working um, in spiritualism, psychic field, I tend to work with them as like real beings that really exist so okay. in the cosmos. So. Sure. That sounds good. Yeah. Do you have any questions for most of my questions got answered, I right? to say. I think it's right. an interesting exploration. And it kind of what you said about the time it was it came from and the similarities with other things, what it really reminded me of was the wealth of the early twentieth century in Europe. And if, if you were one of those guys, Alistair Crowley and those guys writing those books, you joined all the pool clubs. Right. And you, like, on Monday night, you were a Mason. And on Tuesday nights, you were a Rosicrucian. And on Wednesday, now you had a nanny. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie. Somebody else was cleaning your house, and you had a nanny. Because you and the wife would go and do the things. 
And that's kind of what it reminds me of. It's a, it's a high point in that set of cultures where people had the time to sit and do that kind of research. You could get a segment of interest, part of the wealthier people who are interested in those societies to actually do that work. And it kind of sets things up going forward. And yeah, I accept that those guys saw things through their cultural lens and wow, is it Judeo-Christian, no matter how much they scorned it, no matter how much they tried to dismiss it, it's what they were steeped in. Mm -hmm. right? So you can't help but approach it in that way. But as we have stepped further and further away from that as the only option, suddenly, yeah, we're able to take those views yeah, more that's, seriously. And that's where I feel like that's where my approach is. We're living kind of in a society where we're kind of moving beyond like that exclusion of Judeo-Christian background. So I want to kind of share this much wider perspective on some of these words. I like that. I think that's nice. Yeah, that's really great. Good perspective. I like that. Um, in your write-up here, we're talking about... So in the class, one of the things you can expect is uh, receiving a presentation on some of the tools that are used in the Hermetic tradition, how to conduct a few basic rituals, as well as drawing on the influences of the seven spheres and consecrating the sacred band of Isis. So just real quick for people that don't know, what, what are the seven spheres? Um, I'm getting ahead. Oh, oh, they <laughs> no, too okay. far in advance. No, where, okay. do you want, where do you want back I up? mean, in general, we're talking about like astrology would be the seven planetary spheres, okay. which was astrology. So it's the planetary reference, sort of. And all the so symbols are attached to it, I yeah. assume? Okay. In my yeah. practice, I found like the planets are just like our real world kind of experience of it is I, I personally have a philosophy that seven spheres represent seven layers of realities or energies or vibrations sure. of energies and sure. so that's what I call the seven spheres Okay, is that working with these seven vibrations of energy each one gives a different kind of power that you can utilize in magic in, in your practices and everything uh, one of the main things I do is um, anyone who's done like Golden Dawn style magic, there's the middle pillar kind of meditation where you kind of do that before you go into ritual. And I've kind of made a m big modification of that to fit into the seven pillars kind of thing. So um, so I've combined with like chakras, if you've done Reiki, you've gone through the chakras. So I combine the chakras, but I call on each of the seven spheres through each of the seven chakras. And okay. you kind of bring all seven energies into you to work with when you go into ritual. Yeah, so that's something I want to demonstrate. Okay. So I add okay. Greek elements, okay. uh, the yoga okay. elements. Yeah, so it's that. just there to make you more complete and more omnipresent in what yeah. you're doing, and that makes sense. So what what would be like a, um, if you could kind of give people a final takeaway about what your class is about, what would be kind of your final thoughts on that? Final thoughts. Um, well, I'm hoping people will take away like that this is something to really look into, either just as a philosophy of life or as like a deeper type of spirituality, uh, to really get involved in this kind of tradition of, I mean, in neo-paganism, there's a lot of different ways of worshiping like gods. And, you know, there's people, a lot of people who are polytheistic believe in the gods as literal spiritual beings. But you don't see a lot of it in writing, I've found. A lot of it, even when someone claims to be polytheist, I think a lot of people are taught to work through this kind of Jungian psychology of always focus it on, it's in your mind as an archetype, and that's fine to do it that way, but I feel like people who are like spiritualists, polytheists, kind of get a little bit short-shafted in the whole thing. So I want to prov uh, provide a tradition where you do work with the gods as individual beings. Kind of like in, in Wicca, but Wicca tends to have a dual theistic focus where you have a predominant one male, one female deity. Or this I want to give, like, yes, there are the, those two major powers of the, of the divine feminine, the mother, the divine mask and the father, but there's a whole series of deities between their offspring and yeah, in think different about layers. Just how people yeah. work. You know there's an off Sally out there somewhere. Right. Yeah. I guess um, something to compare it to is like um, the voodoo or bodone traditions mm -hmm. where, yeah, they acknowledge as a higher god and a mother goddess, but they work with the individual uh, spirits and deities of the tradition as well yeah. as their predominant focus. So I want to kind of provide that in, um, I guess, a more neo-pagan kind of context. Well, and I think it can also inform 
your perspective on your own practice, even if you don't shift over to hermeticism, having a philosophy, uh, having that as one of the tools in your uh, theological basket as a way to approach how you do your gods, how you do your rituals, how you practice your magics, I, I think it can be a really good addition to that process. And I don't know, I, I, I make my magical students go visit three groups and I make them study things that don't necessarily have anything directly to do with what we're doing. Right. It's to give them those alternate perspectives. Right. Even if you go off and you don't practice it, I feel like there's something to think about. Like, yeah. if you're doing a practice and it says call this deity, maybe it'll make you think, well, what if that deity's really like a spirit and going to show up or yeah. do something rather yeah. than what the book says and it's just you know part of your aspect of your mind. And you start wondering, well, what if it is an actual like being and I have to work with it in a different way? Both perspectives are incredibly yeah. important. Yeah. Because what yeah, if it is all just me? And we all are figments of my imagination. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, we go away. You have an independent will of your own. Oh my goodness. <laughs> kind of an important thing to think about. <laughs> so it sounds to me like where you're kind of coming from is kind of trying to approach people who are interested but maybe intimidated and you're trying to make it more approachable for people to get in, especially if they're not coming from a Judeo Christian background. Is that? Yeah, I'd say that's pretty accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, we're about to wrap this up for today. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, if you have any more questions about Colton's upcoming class, please do leave us a comment below, or you can send me an email like um, I shared earlier in the video, um, and we'll make sure to get them to him so that we can get your questions answered.